Hello and welcome to Horse Player Happy Hour, a very special edition of Horse Player Happy Hour. It's a Saratoga six pack for opening day. I was just at the track. I'm sure we'll talk about that in a little bit. I have moved about three and a half furlongs from Saratoga to the auxiliary offices of the Thoroughbred Retirement Foundation. I thought there was a placard behind me, but I guess it's not in shot after all. So don't worry, I'm not falling over. Uh, not yet anyway. Well, there, there's plenty of time for that tonight because uh, it's a party atmosphere here in Saratoga. So happy to be here with you and so happy to be joined for at least part of this <laughs> broadcast by a man who's nominally on vacation. You can probably guess the state from the palm trees in the background coming to us from the great state of California today. It is TV's Matt Bernier. Matt, how are things? I'm good, Pete. I'm in the midst of and maybe a moment where I'm going to have to cut out because we have to change over our rental car. Got a little bit of a vibration, so... I'll have to move bags, you know, bags around and whatnot. But no, all's good. And I think this is this is absolutely the first time in my life for opening day of Saratoga that I'm actually closer to Del Mar than I am upstate <laughs> New York. So um, no, it's all good. It's it's always fun to be in California for a few days. We're out here for a wedding, so uh, looking forward to taking that in. And like you said, it's opening day up at the spa. There's nothing wrong with that. It's very exciting, and 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 what a, what a year it is to be here. It, it's all the good vibes. I was hoping for so far. Again, we'll talk. We'll, we'll get more into it. Let's tell folks why we're here, though. This is a live stream. On today's show, we're going to have the fifth, sixth, and seventh race from Saratoga. Uh, that's going to be part of the show. But we're really here to cover the first half of this contest. And it's a very special contest because what it is is a way for people, three different ways for people to win their way in to the Breeders' Cup betting challenge. You pay $20, and the first way I'll mention is you can feed in traditionally. You win your way into a qualifier on Saturday, and then if you do well in that qualifier, you can win your $10,000 prize. But it's also an interconnected series that we've been doing uh, most of the year since April. It'll go right up to before the Breeders' Cup, and you can win your way in through the tour. And one way you do it is you're our overall tour leader. Maybe at some point in the show, we'll get a chance to take a look at that tour leaderboard and show you how that's going. But another one where you don't even have to have the eight scores needed or eight scores allowed to, to potentially win the, the, the tour title outright, we also have a system of playoffs. So anybody who finishes in the top two in any of these horse player happy hour weeks automatically gets into this playoff system which will allow its winner to also win the BCBC seat. And, oh, by the way, the top tour finishers who don't win in directly by finishing in the top two, they get in the playoffs as well. So that'll be an 80-person, basically, private contest with a $10,000 prize. And all of these uh, Breeders' Cup betting challenge seats, well, not all of them, but two of the three, uh, the two that are part of the Horse Player Happy Hour Tour, you pay nothing for them. There's no tour fee. This is courtesy of In the Money Media and the Breeders' Cup, and we are super duper excited to be bringing this stuff to you. We encourage you to, to participate. You can play up to three entries, $20 a pop, and all of the proceeds, all of the VIG, as it were, goes to charity. Matt, what is going on out there? Well, we are in the midst of uh, moving the, the cars, so I'm, I'm listening, <laughs> and, and I'm going to chime in on top of what you were saying. You know, the, the way that we kind of designed it, and I apologize if the camera work is spotty at best but um yeah you're no ernie munich i'll tell you that (laughs) the idea trying to do it on the phone and hold it up is not the easiest thing um no i was worried about that plan of yours but i didn't want to be a naysayer i you know it was either this or i guess i could just kill the the visuals you can just listen but you know i think the way that we set up the whole thing was to incentivize folks to play as frequently as possible and i think just the way that the playoff system works along with the regular season I think there is enough of a reason for folks, especially if, if you're a diehard, you have every reason to get involved for the reason that you laid out, just strictly from a sort of a positive EV standpoint. This is a no-brainer. And I think the price point on a week-to-week basis for folks who may be new to contests or, or maybe want to finally dip their toe into the water, I think this is a great opportunity to get involved and kind of cut your teeth a little bit. I'm going to talk a little bit about this race at Saratoga that's going to kick off the contest. Just encouraging folks, if you're on the fence about taking another entry, please do so. It all goes to a great cause. Even throw in one entry where you just play all the fours. We won't judge around here. We'll appreciate you supporting our aftercare charities. We'll talk more about those. Two minutes. I'll come back in. 
Yeah, I, that's cool. We can do the race without you, Matt. Come right back whenever you are able. But let me talk through this first race. So my uh, top number in here was the number seven, Echo Zulu. Uh, for me, on paper, really looked like a runner. The dam has dropped eight winners from nine starters, including Echo Town. These gun runners in general have been uh, have been very impressive uh, so far. So I, I'm very curious to see how number seven, Echo Zulu gets along um, in this spot as we approach this fifth race here at Saratoga. I also want to encourage folks to um, feel free to, to drop in some comments, especially if Matt might be a little bit in and out. You all can help me program the show, and I'll start off. Actually, I'm going to wait, Tom, to read your excellent comics. I think Matt would appreciate that, so we'll wait till he's on the air, and we'll do that one. But other folks with comments on what they think is going to happen in, in the races today, I'm all capped up on the, the back half of this Saratoga card, so we can chat about those races. I'm, uh, I've looked a little bit at what's going on this weekend, not as up on that as I usually am just because of the pure – Bedlam that is uh, opening day at Saratoga. And then we also had the Woodbine pick six uh, force out today. So that also took up some bandwidth. So, you know, we can, we can talk about the big races over the weekend, but if you ask me about the third on Saturday, I'm not there yet. I will be by this weekend. And this weekend, we're going to have a lot of extra content on in the money media uh, in the money uh, uh, players, uh, excuse me, in the money podcast.com. I can't remember my own website. It's hot here in Saratoga. Did I mention that? But uh, we're going to have a lot of stuff covering racing all around the country with a big emphasis on the Haskell. We will definitely get um, Matt's take on the Haskell as well, which is a win and you're in race. We'll share uh, Oracle 65's comment, pleased about the return back to Thursday. The only Thursday I was worried about doing it was, was today, just knowing that I wanted to be um, – doing very well uh, over um, uh, at, uh, at the track, but you know, it's well worth it to, to pop in here. And I think future Thursdays will be, will, will, will be all the easier. Joe Salito points out that both JK and I can be found on YouTube right now. His America's day at the races shift just began. Maybe one day he'll be on the early shift and can come join us on one of these shows. We haven't unfortunately had, um, had a chance to have him on as much as we'd like, but we'll make that happen. Trish Smith asks about Kentucky Farrow after the scratches. Golden Pal will be tough, but think maybe Kentucky Farrow can get a place. And I would agree with that completely. I mean, Kentucky, Golden Pal is your ultimate all or nothing horse. Uh, and I'm going to wait and dive deeper into this race when we have Matt Bernier back with us. Cause I know he had looked at the stakes later and wanted to chat about them. Um, but so, so we can talk about our picks for a second, but I mean, Kentucky Farrow, that's a, a pedigree that I've been very interested in ever since, uh, ever since the switch to turf and be interesting to see. So, I mean, somebody has got to run second, I mean, and, and maybe first, because here's the thing about golden pal. If you like a price horse in that race, I would heartily encourage you to bet your price horse to win or use in picks. And then in your exacta, just play a one-way exacta golden pal over your horse. I don't think you need to use golden pal in second. I think he is a classic win or run out type. So Lady Scarlet has made the lead in this spot. Echo Zulu, my pick, the one that I mentioned, out there in the, in the Winchell colors in second place. Both have what looked to be some impressive speed on. Solasta, a horse that I was trying to beat, um, ended up getting bet pretty hard down to two to one and looks to be uh, maybe in an okay spot there. Let me make this full screen. Maybe I can uh, can come up with something better. I see Matt is is back in the car. He, he'll he'll can join us momentarily. How are things, my friend? We're, we're, we're trying to see. We're trying to see if my Echo Zulu can get the job done here. Lady Scarlet has uh, been looking pretty impressive on the lead, but I'm hoping here when set down for the drive, Echo Zulu is going to get this job done here at a very square four to one. That's a very nice price on this horse who I thought was kind of a standout in this field based on the female family and looks to have put this one to bed a very long way out. So uh, not a bad winner for the start of the yeah, show. We'll see how many, yeah. We'll see how many in the contest had that one. Nothing, nothing came back to get into it from, uh, from, from back of the pack. So uh, we'll see. We'll, I, I, 104 69 I haven't been paying attention to the what the other split of that baby race was so we'll have plenty of context to see and uh, maybe that's something that Sean Tugel and I will talk about we're going to have another episode of baby talk coming up very soon that's our little collaboration with Gainsway Farm um, 
that we'll be doing throughout the rest of the racing season with a big focus on the two-year-old races, handicapping them, and also taking a look at freshman sires and other angles. But uh, surprisingly nice mutual there for that, for that run. Have you had any sort of inkling of the, the track? I mean, that was the very first piece of any racing I've seen today so far. Has there been any kind of funny business with the track or everything kind of straightforward so far? You know, to be honest with you, it's been such a social day, Matt. My gut is yeah. that it's been fair, but I, I, I have to remember, you know, I'm not taking notes. You know, I'm not doing my For usual. Sure. There's no bias <laughs> book out writing in little notes of what each race looked like just because of the, the very social nature of the day. It's it's bedlam over there. You got a, you got a, a whole lot of people out. Watch the first race down on the apron, and it was great with the signature. And they're off at Saratoga race call, and everybody's karaokeing along with John Imbrial, and, and just a, a super enjoyable vibe and and feeling there. And I think you're gonna I think you'll appreciate your return to this place in, in a few weeks' time. Yeah, I mean, I got to be honest. I, when we went up there last year, we had or I I think there was only one show that we did at for NBC, and it was for the Alabama. And it was the most bizarre vibe that I've ever had where you go there and you expect to see 30, 40,000 people on any given Saturday. And there was quite literally maybe 200 people total. And they were all people that were working either with the horses or at the track, the backyard, there was grass everywhere. I've never seen that kind of situation. So now here we are, we get to at least hopefully take in some, some good quality racing for the rest of the meet and, um, I'm very much looking forward to, to getting up there. It's a very minimum. It'll be Labor Day weekend for me, um, if not also Travers weekend. There may be something else brewing. So uh, really looking forward to getting up there. That would be that would be very, very cool. We'd love to have you. Let's talk about the contest itself a little bit. We end up with 182 entries. That's good. That's a that feels like a, the bounce back that we that we wanted for today. People responding to the Saratoga six pack format. Let us know in the comments, by the way, what your opinions are on the different formats. We could have potentially pulled in another track today and done a whole show with six or eight races, whether it was bringing in Woodbine or Gulfstream. I just figured so much of the bandwidth today is on Saratoga. I didn't want to mess with that. Honestly, if I'd noticed Woodbine were doing a force out, I might have said, oh, maybe we should do two tracks. But let me know. Do you like one track? All the last six races at Saratoga, do you prefer the, the three-track format where we can do the whole show on here with a live stream in an hour and a half? I, I, want, I want listener feedback to help us decide. But that 182 number is terrific. That means that the top 18 will win $179 entries into the 717 Saturday Breeders' Cup Betting Challenge Qualifier. Uh, two people after that will get breakage, and then the top 10 will qualify for tour points. I'm not sure if I mentioned that before. And then, as I did say before, the top two get automatically entered into our um, into our playoffs. And look at that. Look who's look who's on top wow. once again, uh, Matt Brunier. David Browning. I mean, you know, it's one race, but still, the guy has been in fuego. He's in our top spot. Really uh, enjoy talking to him and have been following this tremendous run. He's the exact kind of player I had in mind when I thought about this tournament. He's played in the big ones when he's qualified in, but he's not putting down a brick to, to play in the biggest money tournaments. And we wanted to come up with a year long competition that wasn't reliant on somebody having a, a heavy bankroll. I mean, the NHC tour is a super cool event. It, it, it produced a, a budding superstar named Jonathan Kitchen a few years back, but you know, you need to spend, you need to spend money to, to have any kind of shot at that. I love the idea. And I know you love the idea of having this basically 20 race interconnected contest where you could pl you could play in it for $400 total for all 20 weeks, potentially. Yeah, and, and I think it rewards consistency. You know, it's not a matter of you had that one big week or that big weekend and, it, you know, you won everything, which I'm not, you know, dumping on. I mean, look, I, I've been fortunate to be in that position as well and take advantage of it. But I think this also rewards just that consistent week in and week out solid play. And you've seen that from David. I mean, at this point, it feels like every week when we do one of these, he's in the top 10 at least, if not even better than that. So <laughs> I, I just, for me, there's something rewarding too also about the idea of you know what you show up each and every week and you not only give a good account of yourself but i think you prove that it's not a fluke you're someone who you're playing against some of the best names that there are as far as contest play is concerned and you continue to show that you are one of the best so i, I think it's one of those interesting ways to identify who 
some folks may not be familiar with some of the names, but you're getting more and more familiar with these names because they continuously show up and the top half of the leaderboard, and even better than that, the top 10 or 15% of the leaderboard. So I just, I, there's something to me that I really appreciate the consistent nature of this and the consistency that some of these players have shown. I think that's very, very well put and a, a good analysis of it. David Browning, he's got his work ahead, uh, cut out ahead of him today, of course, but uh, one of 31 people who picked, uh, who picked that runner in the uh, in in the first race here of our Saratoga six pack. Now already we have some uh, disagreement, friendly disagreement on the on the the comments about which format is better between the, the one track and the and the three track. We'll get to some of those, but I, for, I wanted to start with this one that goes right to you, Matt. Welcome to California, Tom's <laughs> neck of the woods. Looks like Southern California says you got to get up to Northern California one day. Any travel plans uh, along those lines? I'm not sure. Oh, there's Matt. We uh, we were just leaving area that I would. Oh, we're back. Uh, yeah, we we just left Ojai after a few days. That's about as far north as I've ever been. Um, and it certainly it doesn't classify as Northern California, but uh, it was a good little run. We had a, a good time checking out a place that I've never heard of, but my wife was very fond of it, and we had a great time. And now we are on our way. Certainly going south now. We're going to be down in uh, Malibu for for the next five days or somewhere thereabouts for a family wedding. So it should be a good time. Very cool. Love, 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 love Southern California. Uh, wish once we master this whole being in two places at once thing, it'll be Saratoga and Del Mar for me as often as possible. Uh, Linda chimes in, pleased with the pick in the first race. Hope uh, some folks out there. I mean, a lot of people came up with obviously that runner themselves, but hopefully I was able to lead a few to, uh, to, to the water in that situation. And then here's our, here's our disagreement. We've got Joe who loves the one card format. And then Linda uh, enjoys the, 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 the looking at, at, at different tracks. For me, when I'm betting seriously, I much prefer one. I don't even like doing two if I'm betting seriously. But I get it from an entertainment standpoint, being able to go race, 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 race. That's really cool for, for a little live stream. So I don't know. Maybe we'll mix it up this year. What's your, what's your gut on that, Matt? Well, I, I tend to agree with you. I personally like being able to just sink your teeth into one specific track and know, you know, pay attention to the tendencies and this, that, and the other, as opposed to, you know, let's just use a, a standard Saturday kind of event where you've got 12 races and they're from all over the place. It's hard to really get a good feel for each one of those tracks. But at the same time, I think there is something to the idea of, let's just say, you know, look, you've got great weather up there today. Let's just say you had a day where it was a, a washout. I think there is something to the idea of bringing in other tracks where I don't want to say you're going to get a fairer result because that, that implies that an off track is not a fair result, but you're going to get, I think, a more formful result as opposed to perhaps some of the, the randomness that, that, you know, weather can obviously play in, in racing. So, um, yeah, me, I, I kind of like, especially during the summer, I like the Saratoga runs, you know, crank it out, six races in and out, have some fun, and then you get ready to tee it up for Del Mar. So um, <laughs> that would be my call. But at the same time, like you say, this is all about what the players would prefer. Well, normally we will have Del Mar, won't we? Because Del Mar, they will yep. run at the same time on Thursday. So, yeah, I mean, that's going to definitely be a, a pull. But I could also see, you know, when it's particularly good Saratoga Saturday stuff, um, maybe doing this all Saratoga format and then having more time in between races to to look ahead and and talk about that stuff. Um, Chris chimes in, another person who uh, likes the one track format. So we're definitely um, we're definitely trending that way uh, from folks. So that's interesting data point. Obviously, very small sample. Keep the comments uh, keep the comments coming in. Trish, another one who who likes the the six pack format. That's that's very good to hear. Here we had a question, Matt, that I was dealing with when you were getting in the car. Also from Trish, who's interested in Kentucky Faro potentially after scratches, um, thinking maybe to place to Golden Pal. My initial advice was what I would do in this spot personally is if I liked a horse who was a price, I would want to bet that horse to win or on top in your horizontal exotics and then come back with the exacta as place that concept mike maloney actually talks about it in this book that's right here over my shoulder betting with an edge that that very simple saver routine um when we get matt back in a few minutes we'll, we'll get his take on that whole concept of the exacta as place and also see who he likes 
in that race. Um, Joe also mentions the thing that Matt just mentioned, this idea that with one track, you do have to deal with the weather. He mentions our very own DG meteorologist, DG weatherman, Marshall Sterling over at uh, In The Money. You can follow him at G1 Handicapping on Twitter. And he does do those racing forecasts that can definitely help you in your work. But my question, Matt, was <laughs> your, your general thought about the, the concept of using the exacta as a more sophisticated place bet and then to get your thought on uh, on the quick call today. Uh, I, I broke up a little bit. I just heard quick call at the end. So, you know, for me, Golden Pal, I, I didn't really think there was – too much to get too cute about and i get it perhaps it's a matter of the layoff is going to be the thing that is his undoing but i mean i don't know and, and we've talked about it turf sprints are not my forte i just have a very difficult time imagining if he takes any step forward isn't he just better than everyone else in there then i guess your question becomes who do you round it out with and maybe that was the question you asked um i i don't know i mean you know do you look at a horse like the runner down on the inside you know, I assume he's not scratched out, Kentucky Pharaoh, where they tried to stretch him out and they've gone longer with him. But I do wonder if, if maybe this is an opportunity where that stamina is going to play. Five and a half, I feel like you do get a little tricky, where things aren't quite as cut and dry as just burn out there. That extra half furlong, I think some stamina comes into play. I thought maybe he was an interesting one that could perhaps round things out. But acknowledging that we've, we've talked about this in the past, turf sprints are not my uh, cup of tea. I do think that's a reasonable alternative. The other one I thought was interesting, and maybe I'm influenced by the fact that uh, C.J. Johnson of C.J. Thoroughbreds is sitting with us today up in the uh, the secret spot over there at Saratoga Racecourse. But he made a compelling case for his runner Rebel Posse, and and you know you could just tell you could tell owner energy kind of before races sometimes, and he definitely had that. I think my horse is going to run well. Energy positive reports from the barn on Rebel Posse. And I thought it was also maybe an interesting idea for one to come running in the number. And my point about Golden Pal I was making is I, I do think he's a bit of a win or run out type. If he's moved forward at all, he wins. Sure. I think we all agree on that. But I mean, this is a horse that, you know, eventually they did end up selling to Coolmore, but was supposed to sell to Coolmore, I think last year, didn't vet, and then hasn't been seen so, I mean, the horse obviously yeah. has some issues. And I would imagine when that deal was finally made, it was made at, at some kind of discount as to what the original plan was going to be. But I'll also say this. It's a typical racing, right? You can, you can tell stories uh, from, from either side about the same thing. Wesley Ward, not a trainer who's going to hesitate to scratch, as we've seen on right. many, many occasions, if he doesn't think the, that the horse is right. So that's why I ultimately did side with Golden Pal. But I'd say if you have an idea against – absolutely go with it and i think for it's a really interesting question for let me ask you this if for contest purposes would you have tried to turn golden pal into a free square here or would you have said you know what it's not going to be any points anyway um i'm gonna try to get something in that might pay more to place than his win place combined i i think i would need to have a a strong conviction about one of the other alternatives and acknowledging that maybe they're not the most likely winner, but you could make a legitimate argument that such and such horse could potentially get the job done. For me, I had a hard time looking at the PPs and saying, if, if he regresses any, for me, it would just be kind of throwing a dart trying to find who it's going to be. Because I didn't really think there was one that stood out head and shoulders above everyone else outside of Golden Pal. If he wins, sure, you're not going to collect much. But we've heard Jonathan talk about it, and I start to kind of fall into that mentality now, too. I'd rather collect the points. If I think he's just going to win, I'm just going to kind of chalk it up and say, let me get out of here with a couple bucks, and maybe we take advantage of that. And, and in the long run, maybe those $2 or whatever it may end up being is enough to put me over the top or get me into the top 10, get some points for a contest like this. Especially because it is only a six-race contest. You have limited yeah. opportunities to get points. Got a couple of other um, thoughts on this race from the crew. Chris mentions um, the B horse being potentially second of July, decent debut. Second start was a monster race, says Chris, and uh, follows that up with uh, suggesting to look past the the BC race um, and, and looking at the company of the last. That's one, not one I came up with, but it's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting case for sure. 
Pete, one of the other things I'll mention, you brought up Rebel Posse. Um, one of the programs that I use loves the horse, uh, arguably the fastest in the race. Uh, and there's also something to be said, at least in my opinion, of horses who run against older horses and now drop back in against three-year-old restricted company. And that's exactly what Rebel Posse did at Lone Star in that most recent run. So, I, you know, that to me is a really intriguing angle in that this could, in theory, be a little bit of class relief. So maybe the figs don't suggest that this is one of, if not the fastest, depending on what you want to look at. But I think you get a little hidden class relief going from the older horses back into the three-year-old restricted company. I know that's an angle you love, and I think it's a good one because a lot of people just don't even pay attention to that. And that point that you made about the figure, that was also something C.J. Johnson mentioned, and it wasn't even the program you're talking about because he, he was mentioning just on the – I think he uses the rags and sheets, and apparently the last rags and sheet number of Rebel Posse, the same as what Golden Pal did run as a two-year-old. Now, he admitted, obviously, Golden Pal, if he's right, is supposed to improve – past that but also seems to think his horse is getting better every day and goes here with every chance so make of that what you will folks uh we'll see we'll see how that runner can do a little bit of a production meeting in the middle of the show this is a comment more for, for sure. craig i think to just to to <laughs> note that i think why don't we talk about the haskell stakes and, and potentially use this as a cutout for our friends at uh, breeders cup on social media Matt, I know you've had a chance to, to look pretty thoroughly at this year's Haskell and very curious to get your thoughts on this uh, big summer fixture down there on the Jersey Shore. Uh, do you have a strong opinion in the race? Give us your overview of it. I, I think it's a really good race. Seven horses. I know a lot of people look at it and say not the biggest field, tough to bet. I, I continue to disagree with that. I think these races can offer great opportunities for overlap because some of the shorter prices, he, I think Mandaloon still has a big chance. I, I know he's a little quirky. I know he may hang, sort of kind of, I don't want to say hang at the end, but he kind of pulls himself up when he makes the front. The job's done. Well, we're going to have to work on that. But with the way that this race, I think anyway, could set up on paper, I think following C has to go. I think Hot Rod Charlie, even with the blinkers off, is going to be relatively close. I have to assume Midnight Bourbon is going to be forwardly placed. There's, to me, enough speed in the race for Flo to sit back in that kind of pocket position, maybe two or three lengths off of it. And if he can come with that kind of run that he did in the Pegasus, I, I just think Mandaloon is still better than maybe he gets credit for. And, I, you know, he's not going to be any kind of brilliant price. I would prefer five to two. He's two to one on the morning line. If you can get two to one or five to two, I think I would take it. I think Mandaloon still has a big chance to be one of the best three-year-olds in this crop. Glad to see you sticking to your guns with Mandaloon. I mean, it wasn't pretty last time, but there are excuses to be made and a bounce back could be in order. I can't get off of, of Midnight Bourbon, though. I, I think that um, attacking that fast pace in the Preakness, the horse ran really well, all things considered, from an ability point of view. I, I don't have him too far behind Ron Bauer. And Ron Bauer being one of the ones I would have the, the highest rated of the of the, of the crop right now, based on the, the work they've done so far in the spring and summer. And I just think Midnight Bourbon's going to get an absolutely perfect trip. I think you're right. Following C is going to go. I don't know. Maybe Hot Rod Charlie tries to sit right off. In, in basically, whether Midnight Bourbon ends up attacking whether he ends up sitting off of following C or whether he ends up sitting off of following C and Hot Rod Charlie. I like the trip this horse is, is going to get. I know you've been a big fan in the past, Matt. Where are you these days with Midnight Bourbon? I think he is still just as honest as they come, which is a very admirable trait. He's going to run his race. Um, the thing that I'm a little curious about, and I think totality-wise, the Preakness, a case can be made that he ran the best race, given how close he was to the hot pace and he actually put a, a more than neck in front. He was a length and a half clear before Ron Bauer ran him down. I, I'm curious from a speed figure standpoint where the improvement's coming from because I, I fear we've, I don't want to say plateaued because that makes it sound like he's not going to get any better ever. But, I mean, you go back to the LeCompte, we have five consecutive races between 90 and 96. Three of them were 96s. I, I just, I'm a little worried that he's not, taking the step forward that maybe some of the other three-year-olds are at this point that may be unkind because it's still pretty early in the grand scheme of things um, but for a horse who has at least run a, a, a decent amount like this one has 
I just I want to see that forward move. And, and even if he does take a step forward, say he cracks that 100 buyer, I mean, there's at least two, if not three horses outside of him that I think are capable of earning a 100 kind of buyer. So I, I like him. I think he's a prime underneath candidate. At the same time, you're going to get the best price on him out of the four, the big four, what I'm going to call them as, so basically. So I'm not going to talk anybody off. Those are my concerns. Um, but I do understand the point from a trip standpoint. And again, going back to that Preakness effort, I mean, he, he's a very likable horse. I've liked him forever. I, I think he's a, a neat runner and um, I'll be curious to see what we get. I'm curious your thoughts. I mean, it's fair to say the X factor in the race is following C, correct? No doubt about it. This horse has run very, very fast and looked very, very good and has that late developing look that we can see make impacts in races like the Haskell and the, and the Travers year in, year out. And oh, by the way, could potentially get the best trip of all if, if everybody decides to, if nobody runs with him and it's a speedy day at Monmouth, uh, they could, he could put them in chase mode. Very interesting runner. I, you know, the, the pedigree worries me a little bit. There's a lot of sprint in there, and it makes me think that, you know, one turn is really where he's going to, to flourish. But, boy, what he's done in these two most recent runs, and even his career debut I didn't think was bad when he was out at Santa Anita. The two most recent runs were both spectacular visually. I don't know what he was necessarily running against, and this is certainly going to be the, – the thing that turned me off for him from a win standpoint was just the number of firsts that he's going to be encountering. Um but you have to acknowledge, to your point, if everybody else kind of plays a game of chicken and Joel is aggressive from the inside and they clear off to the front, I believe Time Form US has this color-coded blue from a pace it standpoint, does. thinking that this is going to be a rather moderate tempo. If that's the case, even if this horse may not be a true mile and a quarter type, which we don't know yet, it's too early, but at Monmouth Park getting a mile and an eighth with a relatively cushy trip on the front end, I mean, I could certainly see a scenario where this horse is – we go into it saying it's its the Hot Rod Charlie, Mandaloon, Midnight Bourbon, the Triple Crown Runner show, and it's the horse who has never run in a stakes race before who ends up upsetting everything. I have some fixed odds here, Matt. The, Let's talk. Originally, uh, we were meant to have the fixed odds uh, it, out and rocking and rolling in New Jersey for this one, still waiting for the governor's signature, I guess, or some sort of regulatory holdup that I don't think they're going to have it by Saturday, but it does push me more in that midnight bourbon following C angle, just because I feel Hot Rod Charlie five to four, Mandaloon seven to four, those numbers are short enough where you have a potential following C 11 to two and a midnight bourbon 13 to two. I feel like that's clearly where the value is because I, I also, you know, it's a four contender race. I think everybody agrees about that. And, and then when you're getting such better prices on those two, if that was the case, that would make the decision for me. 100%. I mean, I priced it out and, and looked at it. I have Hot Rod Charlie at 9 to 5. So that would be certainly a sort of fade for me in that spot. I wouldn't be touching that number. Um, as far as Mandaloon is concerned, I made him 5 to 2, but I was splitting hairs between the 2 to 1 and 5 to 2. It was kind of right in that tweener area. Nonetheless, the fixed odds price available still doesn't cut the mustard. So that would be a pass for me as well. You bring up the following C number and the Midnight Bourbon number. I made Midnight Bourbon 6 to 1. That's about a 14% chance of, of getting the job done by my estimation. And following C, I made him 5-1, to one, which is roughly 17%. So those two prices are basically spot on. And this is another instance, too, where I think the beauty of, of the idea of fixed odds, and you can do it paramutually as well, there's nothing wrong if you think you're getting two overlays. You have to make sure that percentage-wise the numbers end up checking out, knowing that you're effectively guaranteeing a losing wager with one of them. But there's nothing wrong with saying, I think these two horses, by my math, I have them at 17% and 14%. So that's 31%, roughly a two to one shot that one of them could end up getting the job done. You know, if you can get two to one odds combined with those two betting them, that's a different way to approach it that I don't think people necessarily immediately think of. Yeah, it's, a, it's a way that I, I like quite a bit, something I've done uh, uh, plenty in my time overseas with the ability to go fixed odds. I don't want to give short shrift to Hot Rod Charlie. We've talked about him, but more in passing. Obviously, you think he goes with a real chance at those nine to five odds. Let me know what you think of this horse and, and what his future might look like. I think he's the most likely winner of the race. Uh, while I'm picking Mandaloon and while we've made the cases for the other two runners or uh, the sort of, I agree with you, the big four, the other three horses just feel like they're kind of overmatched in here. Uh, Hot Rod Charlie probably still doesn't get the credit he deserves. I mean, that run in the Belmont Stakes was arguably the best three-year-old performance 
of the last handful of years outside of the horse that beat him in essential quality. And the, the equipment change is interesting. I'm not looking at it as a positive or a negative. Um, I think maybe just Doug O'Neill, and I haven't read the quotes. So I'm not sure what the, the logic behind it was, if they want to try to make a concerted effort to take him off the pace. Um, I don't know that I love that either. I think he's the kind of horse that you use his natural speed. You go right to the front or you're up there prompting the pace. Um, and from a number standpoint, I mean, if he runs back to the Belmont, he's very clearly the fastest in the race. And even if he regresses some, let's say he goes back to the Derby, you know, a low 100 kind of buyer, he's still right there. So I think he's a really neat horse. I think he deserves the opportunity here. I'm more interested in finding out. We'll find out how the race plays out on Saturday. I want to know what the next step would be, because do you send him to Saratoga to run in the Travers and have that? You know, I think from a sporting standpoint, it would be awesome to have another matchup between he and essential quality. Or do you keep him at home and do you run him in the Pacific Classic where, you know, the Breeders' Cup is going to be mile and a quarter. The older horses out in, on the West Coast, you know, I'm I'm high on a couple of them, but I know some people think uh, they're a little bit of a, a tepid group. I don't know that that would be a terrible idea. He would be one of the favorites, if not the outright favorite, in the Pacific Classic against older horses. So I think uh, it's going to be really interesting to see how Saturday goes and what that eventually sort of leads to for the next step for not just Hot Rod Charlie, but Mandaloon and some of the other ones too. Must see TV with major Breeders' Cup implications in this year's Haskell Stakes. Okay, we've got a few minutes left uh, before this next race at Saratoga. I am guessing we're getting close. Yeah, three minutes to this race number six. Uh, let's see what I liked in here. I'm trying to remember which trying to remember which race this is in the second leg <laughs> of our uh, of our pick six. Apologies, juggling a few too many balls. I like number two, Alba's Star. When we did the, the the show with Marshall Graham, we did a, an in the money plus show with Marshall going over some of the early card races and and looking at this pick six. And I made a case that Alba Star could be alone on the lead and felt like that that was a pretty decent race that Alba Star comes out of with a winner who's already managed to repeat. Um, the favorite was on my short list, number five, Kitten by the Sea. Numbers that fit, trouble in the last two starts, uh, having uh, trouble getting a clean run last time, maybe too wide, two starts back. I uh, catching booking of Irad Ortiz Jr. Nine to five is too short, but if I'm playing multis, I'm going to have some fives in the mix. Maybe the interesting one at the prices is the eight choose happiness. This one did finish ahead of Alba's star and looks like she might just be better on turf. And those horses sometimes... People expect regression, and they go on improving. It's an angle I've been using uh, a lot in terms of trying to find decent price runners. So uh, those are the three that I like. I might mess around with them starting off some some picks uh, here in this uh, in this next one at Saratoga. Uh, what else? Uh, have you looked at any of the other Monmouth card? Do you have a plan, Matt? To, are you going to be looking to bet the Haskell individually, or is that a, a a pick sequence you might get involved in. I know they got a lot of stakes racing down the shore this weekend. Yeah. You know, so going through when we talked about pricing it out and comparing it to the fixed odds that are available, I don't know that I'm going to get the price on the horses that I think are the most likely winners. Therefore, I think you need to kind of create some value. I think you can do that via the daily double. I mean, that's one of my favorite ways to go about it. If I don't think I'm going to get the price I want on the win end on a horse, I'll piggyback and use the race prior and try to get something home there. You know, I, I wish there wasn't as much speed in the United Nations as it looks like there is, because I genuinely believe in Trebovan. I think he's a legitimate grade one caliber runner. Um, I like that Chad is stretching him out as well. I think that speed can play even better. And I'm not convinced he is a need to lead sort of runoff type. I mean, he, he showed in that run on July 4th last year at Belmont park that he can rally from many lengths off of it. So I, I do believe in him. I love that Flavian Pratt who continues to get mounts for Chad. I think that's an important thing to keep note of. Trubavon's a horse I want to keep an eye on. I've never believed in Masterpiece, so I'm going to try to fade him despite the fact that it sounds like, I mean, everyone has said that the entire barn has been high on this horse since they got him. I, frankly, I just haven't seen it on the racetrack. He, he, he's fine to me and just fine. Um, so I think that's probably the way that I'm going to approach this sort of the late double anyway. You have Arklow in there. I think he's going to take some money. Trebovan, though, with the outside draw, no bargain, but 
but I have faith. Flavian Pratt's riding as well as anyone right now. I think maybe I want to try to hook up a Trubavon Mandaloon double between the United Nations and the Haskell and maybe get a, a, a fairer price, put it that way. Makes perfect sense to me. You've been high on Trubavon a long time. It looks like a spot that suits. It's a home game. It is, there's a lot going right for that one. With as much speed as there is, I do think Arklo depending on what other horses you're planning to use, should probably be kept on side. What a cool old boy. Shout out to Arklo and our, our, our friends over there at Donegal Racing, Elliot Honaker, longtime listener. And, and it's just amazing. I mean, I, is it me or has Arklo been running, running as long as we've been doing podcasts, Matt? Well, and, and you know, the crazy thing is too, and uh, part of what I love about the horse, Brad Cox recognized that he was – kind of tailing off for him. And, and I think many people would have just chalked it up and said, well, you know, he's six years old. He's probably getting a little long in the tooth. Maybe he just doesn't have that late kick anymore. He made the equipment change to put the blinkers on four starts back. And you could make a case purely on speed figures that they've been the four best races of his career. And which is wild to your point. He's seven years old now. So I, I just, I think Brad Cox deserves a lot of credit too, for being willing to say, you know what? Maybe we still think there's something there. Maybe this will be the thing that unlocks Pandora's box. And sure enough, here you are. You're sitting on three, four races in a row that he has run, I think, as good, if not better than anything he had done earlier in his career. Let's look at this race at Saratoga as they're going in the gate. Chris Couples is with me. He has two over 5'11". He makes his case on the 11. Uh, maybe it woke up last time, uh, sitting behind a slow pace, off turn, trip, um, wins for fun. Um, what was what was she facing? That's the question, and we're going to learn a lot more here. But certainly one that makes sense to, to put underneath um, in this spot. Oh, kind words from Michael, who appreciates uh, our advice on the shows. We really appreciate you, Michael. You're very active on Twitter as well, and, and we encourage everybody – not just here to be part of the conversation, but also to uh, hit us up on, on Twitter with whatever you want to talk about, pretty much uh, sports, um, horse racing, uh, what, uh, smoking, uh, barbecue, whatever, whatever it happens to be. Uh, hit us up uh, at Bernier underscore Matt, and then I'm at Looms Boldly. All right, we are off. The two had a terrific break. Um, they do look like they're going pretty quick from how strung out they are. So maybe that's going to uh, come back and, and bite us. But there was a, a long shot. I am remembering in the, the earlier turf race, long shot led 99.6% of, uh, of the way. And I felt very bad for my, my friend Anthony, who was live in the pick four on that one. And just it was one of those things where the only time his 11 to 1 shot wasn't in the lead was right there on the wire. Is that but, the wire? <laughs> oh, my God. This is slow. I mean, I I, I don't know how it could be uh, 24, 59 and be that strung out, but uh, that might be a very good thing as it turns out for, for Alba Star, though Kitten by the Sea, that big favorite we talked about, is in a really strong attacking position. So Alba Star is going to have to be good to get this one done. Choose Happiness we talked about as well. Very much in the mix, just a couple of lengths off the pace. Looks like Kitten by the Sea is making that move to the turn. We're going to find out what Alba Star's uh, fate on the day is very shortly here. But this is this is not easy when you have that heavy favorite breathing down your neck. Who looks like to be making runs from the back? There's somebody cruising up there in the blue silks. That looks like number six. I'm not sure which runner that is. Um Meanwhile, up top, it does appear that the favorite has wrested control of this one. I'm hoping Choose Happiness can uh, maybe switch leads and come in with a late run. The six looks to have flattened out. Kitten the by inside. the sea. Yeah, we got one who made a little run through on the inside. The four finishing very strongly. This one could be uh, head and head here to the wire, but it looks like the four is going the better. And it's going to come four, five, maybe eight. Dead tight for third there in the sixth race at Saratoga. We'll see, we'll see how that all shakes out and how it affected the leaderboard in just a couple minutes' time. You know who I, I, I assume the riding assignments that I have listed are still what they are. Forgive me for not having all the scratches all over the place. But Eric Cancel, if, if it was him again, he, you know, I feel like we've seen it in, in all sports, and it was Cancel. You see, those he, he young... was also Matt. He was also on that that eleven to one that almost won. It was a great I tell you, ride. I tell you what, he he feels like that young player in whatever sport you pay attention to, who is always shown glimpses, but just takes a little while to finally put it all together. And I'm telling you, he he's riding really, really exceptionally right now. I love how aggressive he is on some of these mounts. 
Um, you know, I felt like everyone thought early on he was going to be sort of the next rider in New York a number of years ago. And it just took a little while. But I think he's just riding fantastic right now. What he did at Aqueduct was amazing. And I agree. He really does seem to have kept that confidence from late in that meet where he made that furious run to, yeah. to, to get the title and, and kept Carmich, it with him. Yeah. Yep, to 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 with through Belmont, and now apparently at Saratoga. I mean, these are these aren't just winning when you're on the best horse. These are stylish runs. I mean, a couple of eleven to one shots. Uh, are are we ready to start upgrading Cancel? I think I'll look at it if it's a spread race. I might say, okay, I'm going to put that one in if I'm on the fence between two and Cancel's riding one. I might lean towards that one. I'm not going to do anything crazy, but I don't think it's I don't think it's nuts to pay attention to those short term fluctuations in form you can sometimes get out ahead of the crowd get out ahead of the computers when you're willing to take a little bit of a stand on on something that's you know it's not a hunch it's data-based yeah. but but maybe it's theoretically too small sample but that's how you get the value if you wait till that trainer that starts off the meet five for five if you wait till he's one five i mean it's it's useless you yeah, might as well it, start betting against at that point and and i'm guilty of along the lines of of that with with biases i'm guilty of waiting too long to the point where it's abundantly clear and everybody and their <laughs> brothers taking advantage of it and you have no edge but i agree with you with with instances like this you're still going to get big prices with the mounts that he's on because he's not riding one or two for chad he's not riding one or two for todd he's not riding one or two for asmussen or anyone else you're still going to continue to get these prices and this is a way that maybe he does continue to get some more mounts from some of those bigger barns. And eventually, I, I think basically a long-winded way of saying you're still going to get good prices on mounts that he is on that you think right now, or feels like anyway, he's just in the zone. I feel like he's taken that step forward that many people thought he was going to at some point. And I love that he's doing it in different ways. I mean, it's one thing to have a, a, a bag, if you will. One thing to have a yeah. skill that you do and you do well. I think of Luis Saez and how just great he, he is on the front end. Not that he can't win on a closer, but you know what I mean? I, totally. I think of his signature rides and, and they're all there. It's pretty cool when it's dirt, it's turf, it's it's speed, it's closers. It's, it, it speaks to something um i think inherent in a developing skill set that is absolutely worth paying attention to uh, let us know um let us know what you think who are some of your favorite riders at saratoga people who you're looking for uh, this meet to do to do well um we would love to we would love to hear that story uh chris points out the four getting the same trip a rail skimming ride presumably um uh, 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 one year ago here at Saratoga, Steve. Uh, oh, very, very nice. Steve gives nice shout out to our Saratoga lifestyle pod. We had a lot of fun putting that one together, Matt. We did two hours on things to eat, drink, do, see in Saratoga. And uh, of course, barely scratched the surface, such yeah. as the the life up here. I'm sure uh, I'm sure you, you, you'd be a good contributor to a show like that in the future. The problem for me is, and I'm guilty of this with street names, with other things, wherever it may be, I love where I go. I don't remember the name of anything. <laughs> so when you gotta do, goes, you gotta like check in on your social media or or take. You know what I've started to do about that, especially with like if I'm in a weird place like wines and beers, but also just names of places. You just you bust out the phone and then you've yeah. always got a rack, and that's super easy, and you don't have to feel. You know, some people. That's what I would say you should do as far as that goes. What I've started doing, and I, I it's so embarrassing too. Like when I get paired up with folks and I play golf, if it's with strangers. I, I hear, you know, you greet yourself, you introduce yourself. Oh, your name's so-and-so. And the moment that conversation is done, I don't remember their name. And I feel like just a complete jerk. So I've started writing their name down with like a little indicator on the card. That's so I don't, funny. I feel like I need to just do that in general. This is bad if this is happening, by the way, when I'm, I'm 31 years old. What's it <laughs> yeah, going to be like? By the time you get to, to 48, like me, just... you're host. <laughs> the one trick I've heard that works with that situation, we'll throw this out there, um, for name recognition. Have you tried the saying the name back to them? It helps a little. I have not, but I've also, have you heard about uh, the moment you meet someone, you hear their name, you then equate it to someone who you know with that name. Oh, that's good. And I'm, I've done I, it a couple times and it's worked, and other times for me it hasn't worked. But <laughs> I, I, it's it's definitely at least a way for me to kind of, you know, if I think of oh, uh, 
Peter Thomas Fornital, uh, Peter Rotundo. Uh, you know, like, you know, you, you think <laughs> the of other Colin, Italian. The, the, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, pretty funny. Uh, David Browning, look at this man. Look what he's up to. He hits another one. 51 80, the leading score. We've got the top three. Julie Laboyko is right there. Michael Domable, who's going to be doing some writing for us over at InTheMoneyPodcast.com, covering the Colonial Meet, which I'm really excited to see. He's been in a whole lot of those games. Good to see his name up there. Uh, and, yeah, a bunch of people ended up with this, this four in this spot. We'll give a few more shout-outs going down the line. Todd Van Drie, uh, Robert Fabricatore. I'm guessing he was rooting for Yazuri with me last <laughs> Sunday. Uh, Gary Adley, uh, Bruce Meyer with two entries. We've seen Bruce use this strategy very effectively and bruce that i think bruce is was oracle in the comments before yes. from getting my handles correct um yep. we've seen him do this with the multiple entries with the, with with similar picks and then sometimes he splits and sometimes he goes the same a little bit of a hybrid approach here i really like this almost like multi-race betting one of the cool things on horseplayers.com who i probably haven't plugged enough um in this broadcast so far which is a great place to do all your qualifying for the two biggest tournaments there are the national horse players championship and the breeders cup betting challenge but with these pick and pray events that means you put in all the picks before the contest starts prevents people just playing horses because of the prices they are late in the game and it's kind of cool because you can see who people pick so let's say you know you've noticed how great of a job David Browning's doing in these contests. At the beginning of the contest, uh, once the first race goes, you can see his pick. So it's not like you can copy them for the contest, but then maybe you're playing a double or pick three later, and there's a race where you don't have a strong opinion, and you see David Browning put three entries on the four. Maybe you want to throw in the four. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a good way. And I haven't done the full dive on it, and I don't know if you wrote about it in the book or had spoken to someone about it where they would go through and – basically analyze the results of the winners or the folks who did well mm -hmm. in a certain yep. contest and then kind of reverse engineer it and try to use that going forward as some some helpful tidbits to you know what was it about this horse you know let's just use the race that we just had what was it about the four that so many people liked and you go back and you try to kind of conjure up the, the rationale or the reasoning behind it and try to use that to your advantage in the next instance the next time that you're in that same kind of position does anybody in the watching live at, with access to um, comments want to give us their case for the for the for the four? I'd love to hear what it was. Oh, here's a great note from Joe. Speaking of jockeys, we were talking about before Dylan Davis with a couple of yeah. consecutive double digit odds runners, and you know Dylan was riding so well before the injury, uh, and this is a trend you'll see repeat itself over and over again with riders. They they come back from injury. And they're a little bit hungrier and they're rested and the injury is behind them and they can build that positive momentum. So Dylan Davis, I think that's a really good call on a rider to, uh, to, to potentially pay attention to. Steve is a big fan of a Tyler Gaffleone on <laughs> turf. The Gaff Daddy. Gaff Daddy. <laughs> I like that. I like that. We might have to steal that one, Steve. Um, so, yeah, let us know. We're, we're curious to, to get your opinions on, on all of this stuff. One caveat I'll issue. This is a little down the rabbit hole, but these are serious contest players. They can, they can handle it. So because your picks in the pick and pray are revealed, very often you'll have pick and pray contests and live contests at the same time. Be aware that there are cheeky people. Horse players are cheeky people trying to get an edge any way they can. There are people who will pay attention to what, what picks you put out in the pick and pray contest and then potentially try to block you or thwart you with those same picks later. So just, I'm not saying you can't play in a pick and pray when you're playing a live, but just know that that information's out there. Now, maybe I'm going to make a bunch of people outsmart themselves and they're going to get really mad at me here, but I would just be aware of that. And if you're in a situation where you could get blocked, where you're worried about getting blocked and you know your pick was published somewhere else, eh, maybe you don't want to put, you know, maybe you don't want to, um, Pick that horse in your live contest if you have another um, a, a, another idea. Anyway, just to – No, hey, look, I don't want to assume that this is what happened, but a few years ago when I was still working with the racing form, I was playing in a BCBC qualifier that Saturday, and going into the final race, I was in the lead. And uh, oddly enough, Arklow's name is going to come up in here again. <laughs> it was a race from Kentucky Downs, and we had done a stakes preview – and the horse that I liked was from New York. I can't remember the name off the top of my head, but was in that eight or nine to one range. And I started getting into my own head of like, well, would anybody actually go and watch the video 
just to see, you know, maybe one thing or the other, right? I go, don't overthink this. Take the horse that you like. You pick the horse in the video. You're going to get a good price. You block some people that end up taking it behind you and just hope that the favorite doesn't win. The picks come in. I'm the only one with that horse. The next 50 people don't have it. And I couldn't help but think. I was like, either I was terrible in my <laughs> handicapping and this horse has no chance whatsoever. Or people did exactly what you said. At least said, well, I don't want to make sure that I've blocked myself out by taking the same horse that this, this dummy ended up picking in a video. So I don't know if that's exactly how it played out or not. But I could not. Whenever the picks were finalized and I looked and I said, not one person has this horse. That's so amazing. It was unbelievable. And sure enough, Ark Lowe, he was the only one who could beat me. And he got up and he won the Kentucky Cup uh, from, I don't know, it had to be three or four years ago now. Um, and he ended up beating me to bounce me out of the BCBC. Oh, my God. That's yeah. too funny. Chris Couples can relate uh, about uh, being on the wrong side of that. Uh, says he's had that that card played on him before. We've got a couple of people chiming in about the winner of the last race. Top performance fig on HTR, the handicapping software that Matt and I both uh, use, well, I use from time to time. And I think Matt is uh, back in a, in a good run of using it as well. And he makes the, the key point that the price was going to be right. And sure, it was. And then um, here, here's a comment from John. Um, similar pattern to a win last year. I like that idea. Aqueduct in the winter, layoff back at Saratoga. Training at Belmont, had opportunities to run there, chose to run in this spot. I love that. I mean, I love two things about that. The, the pattern thing of when horses win or run their, their good races, that's something that we as humans can do better than a computer. And it's something to absolutely pay, pay attention to. And, and then that idea of just trying to think it through like the owners and what races mean to connections at Saratoga. The, the line, I think it was Keith O'Brien told me, gosh, 20 years ago, a win at Saratoga is worth four at Belmont. And, and you know, people with that in mind, they're, they're going to handle a horse differently. And when you can tell yourself that story and it makes sense to you, you can do um, – you, you 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 can do pretty well. Uh, Michael chimes in. We we've now discovered the famous oh Matt picked him angle. <laughs> we, we can we can we can get some extra winners. Uh, we can get some extra winners that way as well. Um, let's P talk piggy, about the piggyback, oh, piggybacking on that real quick. The idea Please. of sort of placement and things. This is not uh, rocket science, and it's been well documented. But keep an eye at the end of the meeting, this Saratoga meet with whether it's owners or trainers with aggressive drops and aggressive moves because they want to win the title. So you, it's not always a red flag when a horse drops in, you know, I, I always think of like Chad and Clarevich when they've got a horse, that's probably a good allowance horse. And all of a sudden they're in an open 50. It's not, it's not really the red flag that they want to lose no. the horse. It's just that they want the win. And I'll say, I feel like Matt, that you're absolutely right. That, that in the old days, I felt like that was, a good like last two weeks angle now, especially with Chad and, and Todd. Yeah. The, 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 I think you could see a horse in the first week that was yeah. taking a, a big drop like that. Just say, Nope, they're thinking about the title. They know it's like a, a, a baseball team that the win in uh, the, the win in September is worth the same as the win yeah. in April, really in the big picture of life. So be, be aggressive, especially for those outfits that, you know, whatever the horse isn't going to win a stake, so let's let's get a win, uh, especially a win at Saratoga, worth four at Belmont, and then we have a, another stall that we can put the next horse in who we think is going to win a graded stake for. So, I mean, that you're too young to even know how good negative uh, drop angles used to be, and they're, the new economics of racing and what racing is all about now. It's it's very rare. It's a very rare that I even consider it an, an angle. Uh, yeah. Maybe if I had some negative info on a horse or there was a bad work and a drop, or if it's a smaller barn, I still, I really don't like it at all. But with these, you know, machine bigger outfits, um, I, I don't, I don't find it. I don't find them. You, it's hardly even useful to know. I mean, what, it comes up, but it's not like it used to yeah. be. And John Gasper points out, it, and this is exactly right, with the purses raised for the claimers, um, they can, you can still, it's not even a bad economic decision. You know, right. sometimes you drop, we were talking about dropping for the emotional reason of the win at Saratoga, but let's just say you can win this big purse 
get back money that way. And oh, by the way, maybe cash, cash a bet. <laughs> All yeah. of a sudden, yeah. it, 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 makes a, it makes a lot of sense. It's, and and you know. if the horse gets taken too. I mean, that, that's not necessarily that that's what the, the end game is if you're in a claiming event. But the idea of, to that point, the purse structure is just so massive at Saratoga. Not only can you possibly win with an aggressive move, if the horse gets taken, all right, the horse gets taken, but it's not like you're going to be dropping into a 20 claimer. You're probably in a, a 50, in some instances, an 80 or a $100,000 claiming event. You know, I, I just, to your point, the economics make it so that it's not really a crazy move anymore, you know? Absolutely. I want to give a shout out to our friends. We're back as the opening act for the terrific Cocktails and Conversation show tonight. Frank Miramati, the mere man, he is terrific. Uh, fantastic talker. He'll be on our network this weekend as well, doing uh, a back and forth with Brian Skirka talking about all the, the Haskell stakes. But they're all, they're going to be doing uh, Haskell Day stakes, but they're going to be doing a deep dive on cocktails and conversation about the Haskell itself. I'm sure pizza will be discussed. Frank, one of the most knowledgeable uh, pizza authorities in these here United States. I, I, I think I might put Paulie G ahead of him, uh, and, and he does it for a living. And then I, I think Frank might might round out that exact. Uh, they're going to have a lot of fun on that show. I think it's 6 or 6.30. Check local listings, but it'll be right here on the Breeders' Cup social media. And folks looking to get more of a deeper dive on on the Haskell should absolutely check that out. Really. I, I love the job that, that those guys do on, uh, on cocktails and conversation. Have you, if you, I haven't been on one of those yet. Have you been on one of those? Uh, yes. Many moons ago, we had a little, um, they had the entire NBC crew roll through in like different segments. So we, we did that, uh, oh boy. I mean, probably two years ago now. I mean, it, it's been a minute, but, um, they do a great job. And like you say, uh, Nick and Britt, they, uh, keep churning out they bring in great guests they have uh you know i think they get more into the the stories and background sort of things than you know maybe maybe that's not our forte we're the ones trying to go over the the form and try to pop some winners but those two they're they're as good as they get when uh as far as doing proper interviews, you know? <laughs> yes. Yes, indeed. It's, it's c covering the great sport of racing in their inimitable way. And as far as I'm concerned to, two of my absolute favorite broadcasters, a, 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 nice to be opening the, opening the curtain for them on the Breeders' Cup social media programming here on a, on a Thursday. Once again, Chris has to take off. He's going to send in some opinions for later. We'll read those as we get to them. I think we've got some time and we should look ahead to the stakes race later today, Matt, this traditional opening day feature. It's not, I mean, maybe that's overstating it, but for the last several years anyway, for the two-year-old fillies, we've got the Schuylerville uh, grade three action going six furlongs on the dirt. I know you've had a look at this one. Very curious to, to hear your thoughts about it. Yeah, I guess before we dive into it, what was the reasoning for the scratch of Happy Soul? Do we know? I have not heard. I mean, okay. Wesley Ward, it's, it doesn't need much reason, right? I mean, yeah. we know that he feels like he's very in tune with how his horses are doing on the day. I'll dig, while you talk about the race generally, let me dig a little bit on Twitter and see if there's any further intel about that that we can bring to the people. Well, and, and why I brought that up, I, I, she was far and away the, the most likely winner of the race, but I was kind of looking forward to getting inflated prices on other fillies that I thought could take a pretty significant step forward here this afternoon. So it's unfortunate from that standpoint, from a, from a gambling perspective. Um, I think now with her gone, the inside two fillies, both per, pretty birdie and mainstay from a pace standpoint, I think they are the speed of the race. Mainstay was really, really impressive splashing home at Monmouth Park. Now, I'm always a little bit leery about wet track, first out of the box, blowout victories. But four and a half to win by almost eight lengths, that, that, uh, that takes a pretty special animal, I think, to be able to do that sort of thing. So I think the inside two both make plenty of sense. I made them both five to two on my line. For me, though, the horse that was most intriguing, well, there were two. I'll give you the one that I didn't end up picking because I think she's going to need more distance down the road. I think Queen Camilla is okay. I know maybe the figs don't suggest that. Antonio Sano doesn't ship just for the sake of shipping. I think he sends good horses when he thinks that they can run a little bit, I think, back to Gunavera. Queen Camilla is the kind of horse, I think, you get her out to closer to a one-turn mile or two turns down the road. I think she might be okay. Uh, the horse I landed on, though, was the nine, Cartel Queen. Um, a little bit slow on figs, but I love that she was bet 
like a good thing in the debut at Keeneland. And no, she didn't get it done, but that doesn't bother me. She comes back at Churchill Downs. And in the grand scheme of things, I thought she had a really educational day, uh, run there when she broke her maiden. She was down on the inside, a little bit of an uncomfortable position. The rider just tapped her with the stick at one point rounding the far turn, and she immediately moved up right up on heels, got into a tight spot. She was eventually able to extricate herself, and she finished really, really well. Um, the blinkers on doesn't really bother me. I read that Tom Amos had mentioned that he thought that she was a little intimidated when she was down in and amongst those horses, and maybe this would kind of get her to, to sharpen up a little bit. I, I just I thought it was a really good, solid performance for a horse who, yes, she's light on figs, but at this time of year, I'm not going to let the fig be the end-all, be-all. We've seen these boys and girls at this time, this early in their career, jump up by leaps and bounds. Uh, the outside draw with a rad, I made her 7-2 to two now. I like the 9 cartel queen. It's a good case, and we did hear from Chris that he was also uh, in the mix on that one. I want to take a look and see. Haha, here's an angle on Cartel Queen, Matt. Microbiome uh, ran very, very well in victory back in race number two. Uh, these two have been working together. I, th I think Microbiome might have even had the better rated work, but still, just the fact that y y you've got that as another, another positive angle that a winner on the card – um, uh, was working working with that one, so that that makes a lot of sense to me. The horse that I think the horse that I was interested in, yeah, my horse scratched too. I, I thought Pipeline Gal was going to be interesting. The other Amos runner, and isn't that interesting? Uh, trainer enters two scratches one. That's often a huge push for the other horse. Now I haven't spoken with Tom. I don't know, but it's it's a very interesting angle and, and I think as good of a direction to go in that spot as anywhere. Curious to hear what anybody else has to say about uh, about the Schuylerville. I, I mentioned that, uh, that 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 we did have another vote from, from Chris for that one. Um, yeah, and he, oh, that's funny. I looked it up. I could have just popped his comment on screen. I thought they'd work together, but I wasn't sure. And uh, he makes that, that point as well about the little collateral form, cross card collateral form boost. Maybe I'll start using that. I think another thing from an angle standpoint this time of year that I'm really interested in with the two-year-olds, as opposed to getting caught up in the figs that they have run, I like to look, and I mean, this, this applies to all races, but specifically with the, with the babies. Look and see what the horses behind them came back to do next out. Oh, Did absolutely. they improve or regress? Because to me, that it, it applies much more so with the young horses than it does for the older horses. The older horses, you kind of know what you've got at that point. With the babies, you can have a race that looks brilliant. And if no one comes back to do any kind of running, I, I mean, I don't care visually how good it looked. It, it was a bad race. This race for Cartel Queen on May 20th at Churchill the sixth and seventh place finishers came back and earned buyers of 58 and 52 in their next start. The 58 did come on grass, but point being, those figs are close to the fig that Cartel Queen herself earned in victory that day. So it makes me think that if she, I'm not suggesting she's going to jump up 40 points here this afternoon, but if she takes a, a step forward that I think she's capable of, there's no reason she's not into the mid-70, high-70 range. And I think that puts her squarely in the mix of this thing. It's a it's a compelling case. All right, a couple of things on Happy Soul. Trainer Scratch heard Tom, and then Michael heard, I'm not sure if this is fever. a rumor or reporting, that it was a fever. So we'll see where she ends up running next. I'm also curious where Pipeline Girl ends up running next. I had just liked the idea that Pipeline Girl had shown the ability to pass horses and had one going six. I feel like the subtle difference I mean, it's, it's a significant difference between five and a half and six, even though it might seem yes. subtle. So something else to, to part potentially. Of the part of the reason I brought that up about Golden Pal and with that, we're talking about Kentucky Pharaoh with the idea of the stamina, you know, the, the five to five and a half. Half furlong doesn't sound like much, but to your point, you bring up the, the five and a half, the six piece. I mean, a half furlong can feel like a mile, yeah. you know. 100%. They're getting out a little late. Four minutes to post here at Saratoga. Maybe that heat, I mean, I will say it was cooler, just one of those things, cooler in the backside, um, and there's some shade in that paddock, whereas once they get out on the track, the, the sun is just beating down. Yeah. I, I had a cheeky friend uh, text me that I, that I should stop yawning on the on the broadcast, and, and I'll <laughs> accept the criticism, but I, I, I'm not bored. I'll tell you what happened to me, Matt, and I think you'll, you'll appreciate this. I wrote about it a bit in my... Uh, and then at the races.com piece that just published on their website 
previewing the, the entire Saratoga meeting. I suggest people check it out. It's largely based on the stats work of Matt Vagvolgi, who does such a great job for us over at InTheMoneyPodcast.com slash plus. Um, and, and I took a cherry picked a few examples and put them together. But I, I explained in my intro that the last time I had a night like last night, I, I know when it was. It was it was December 24th, 1979. Wow. When seven-year-old me woke up at two in the morning and was so excited for Santa Claus that he could not go back to bed for oh, at no. least three hours. And in a weird way, I didn't mind it because usually I get insomnia and it's usually like stressful. Eh. Did I send that? Uh, did I send Drew the TPS report? Did I? That uh, who am I going to get to cover uh, Mammoth yeah. with me on the on the show on? So just you know the the mind starts racing with with work things and sure. it's 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 that and this was not that at all. It was I'm ready to go, folks. I can't wait for this. And, yeah. and I have to say, it's it's an experience that's delivered. I'm already giddy for, for six minutes from now when I can when I can walk back over there and enjoy the the stakes races and, and maybe have a cocktail. I meant to get over to our friends at uh, Walt and uh, Whitman Brewing in Saratoga and, and grab a beer. I was going to have a beer on the show, but I just ran out of time. I'm not sure. You know, last year we did all these Saratoga horse player happy hours. I was live from there, which was an absolute hoot. But uh, they're, they're, it's a great problem to have. They're doing so well that they've extended their hours. I was nervous about doing it in a non-empty room. Um, so I thought this was safer. But we want to keep the Walton Whitman involvement because um, we do, we, I do love that place. And it's a, I think it's soon to be a Saratoga institution. Definitely one of the places you have to go and check out, whether it's to have a beer in the bar, uh, a nice meal, or the cafe upstairs is also fantastic. But anyway, future shows, we're going to have some Walton Whitman uh, beer. Um, but but I, I, it, it was just that kind of – it was that kind of atmosphere that it just, just electric – charged yeah um but it's always like that but it was so much more so for having missed last year i know we had a saratoga meet last year and i'm glad we did it was a wonderful distraction in the middle of a very difficult time but let's face it saratoga last year it was belmont north and anybody who tells you different is lying we just we didn't have the horses coming in from all over the country on a, on a meat long basis and we've got that again and this ability to all be together in a celebratory mode it's it's the VE day for our generation, as far as I'm concerned. And I can even remember it, that it may have been on the first horse player happy hour we ever did. Early pandemic, nobody knows what's going on. We just know everything's amok. And I remember saying at that time, I, I'd heard the phrase uh, COVID winter used by the, the, the great um, uh, virologist uh, Michael Osterholm. And I was thinking, okay, winter, four months. We do this for four months. Maybe we could be back in Saratoga for August. And I remember fantasizing and even saying the words, oh, what a party that's going to be <laughs> when we get back to Saratoga. Obviously, I was ahead of the game. I'm an optimist by nature. I'll cop to that. But let me tell you, I, I was right in the sense of, oh, what a party it will be. It just took a year longer than I hoped it would. Yeah, and, and let's hope that we never have to go through that ever again to, to get to a beautiful situation like this. But I, I'm with you, man. I, I'm looking forward to getting up there this year. I, I was one of the, the few fortunate ones that actually got to go to the track last year for an instance, but it, it, it wasn't the same. It wasn't Saratoga. And getting there with all the people in the backyard and the band playing and just all, you name it, going to the paddock bar or just hanging out, going wherever. There's something about Saratoga, and I'm not going to get into the whole – I saw all the, the people going back and forth over the past few days while I was flying out here about what's better, Del Mar or Saratoga. I'm not going to get into that because I don't, I don't really care. But the idea of – Why can't they both just be great? That's my Yeah, idea. just, you know, and, and <laughs> even if you don't like one of them, who cares? Just shut up. <laughs> but, the, <laughs> but the idea of just being able to go out there and have a good time and not be thinking about – basically life i mean i i don't have a better way of putting it but when you go there you have an opportunity to just kind of kind of let loose and not think about the the real life stuff that we all have to deal with and especially on the heels of what we dealt with for that you know 15 16 17 month stretch of time so i'm very much looking forward to getting up there um it's a shame it won't be till the end of the meeting but now it may very well be two different trips so i'm, I'm really looking forward to it 
All right, fingers crossed we get to see you sooner rather than later. Shout out to Azo, who uh, thanks us for the show. Lenora says hello. Lenora, we will say hi back to you. Um, <laughs> this is cheeky, but it's funny. I think you'll appreciate it. Before it's too late, shout out to Matt's driver. I'm assuming his lovely wet right wife for a very smooth ride. ITM should cook in gas money, especially in California. Totally fair. Send me send me a <laughs> bill. We'll, we'll send so it to Drew, actually, but you know, let's get it done. The funny thing is I was waiting for some comment about how like smooth it is right now because we are driving through and I realize we're off the road for a minute. And I'm like, where are we going? Uh, we have been sitting in an In-N-Out parking lot for, <laughs> and she's and she's over eating oh. some hamburger over at one of the picnic tables. She keeps waving over and she's like, I have food. Like, oh, I'll could, get to it in a minute. We're good. We're, we've only got a couple minutes left. But you could, you could tell her we got. She got a nice. Uh, she got yeah. a nice shout out there yeah. <laughs> from Tom. But yeah, she Tom. was. She was uh, pinch hitting as far. Typically, I'm the one that does the driving whenever we go anywhere. And I said, look, timing wise, on Thursday, we're gonna need to. I need you to pinch hit. She's like, that's fine. We can handle it. So that would have been hard. That reminds me of the time that J.K. dropped in from the road. Um, I think he was driving and 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 doing the thing, and I think it was John Gasper who made who made the comment. It's amazing that that JK's Uber dri- Uber Uber passenger <laughs> doesn't mind him doing the live stream while he's on the. I blew the joke by fumbling the word, but it's my brain is my brain is tired. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna cop to that uh, a thousand percent. Though Joe has sympathy for me. If you weren't lying awake in bed at least a little bit last night, you've lost your soul. I, I can't disagree. I can't disagree, especially if you had the opportunity, like me, to be one of the fortunate ones who are here. Can't wait to hear what the announced attendant is on this one. They definitely went to post late here. Not sure what's going on for that. Yes, John says that was me. Good line. We got it on there. I did tell JK that on air, I think, and he appreciated it. He was not, <laughs> he was not offended. He was not offended at all. So, um, Pete, I, I know you said you haven't really looked at, at Saturday at all. Um, just a couple things to – kind of flag with everybody I, diana maybe it's not the vintage you know rendition of it but at the same time it's a pretty darn good race you've got the, the phillies coming in for charlie appleby that ran in the just the game they'll be back in this spot you've got a number of other horses that have done great things harvey's little goyle's a great one winner pocket square is interesting for chad i think i still believe in magic attitude i want to give her another chance anyway maybe at this mile and an eighth they'll help but more importantly at least to me that Sanford on Saturday is a massive field. They got 12. No. 12 two-year-olds going six furlongs. And I haven't done a deep dive yet, but I just remember how taken I was. It was on, I think it might have been the first race of the day on Belmont Day, when Wit won from 100 out of it and won by 100. And I just said, oof, first time started, not supposed to win that way. And um, he's, he's drawn down on the inside. I don't know if he's going to be able to, work out some kind of a trip from down there and frankly again i haven't done the work yet i don't know who else is in this but boy he's i was really taken by that debut performance from wit definitely one worth shouting out i, I forgot to give my opinion in this race ridiculous i oh. thought the th- it's too late it's it's uh but the, the the three i thought was maybe a little bit of value business model and then the obvious the entry looked super obvious either half with claims and then I, I also was a little bit interested in the two Southern District, very similar profile. But the entry may prove very hard to down. I wonder, I wasn't paying attention. We'll see what price they got bet into when they flash it up on the screen I, here. I had seen three to two at one point. That's not bad, honestly. It, interesting to see uh, the 1A all the way out the back. Though I'll tell you, I don't gen- generally I don't mind when you see one half of the entry on the lead and the other far back. Ajawid may be a little too far back, but we'll see how fast they're going. The horse does seem to be running now. Um, team tactics potentially in play for the Shadwell entry here. Arham going to my eye pretty darn well on the lead. I, I see uh, Dak Daniels in the mix. We have... Uh, on Sky Sports Racing, there, there's a – I forget where in England they're from, but a pair of brothers, they bet all the booze-themed names. <laughs> and it was many moons ago now, but they scored out nicely on Dak Daniels. Surely they'll be they'll be back aboard in this case. Okay, real running about to start here. Looks like Arham's working pretty hard. A um, couple of longer prices in right behind. Dak Daniels down there maybe can get a rail run. Um yeah, the Arham looks tired. Is going to have to really do some finding in this spot because uh, 
looks like is that Clay the Lionheart making this big bold move up on the outside. And then we'll see if any if any deeper closers are coming. And we'll also see if Arham has anything left. And there's that seam for Dak Daniels, who is going to make that bold run up the inside and looks to be finding for me inside the pole. Maybe it's going to be him head and head with this number nine. Outside uh, who, runners got steam too. Ten. Oh my like goodness. This this is a good finish. Dak Daniels uh re breaks a bit there late in the matter. That's that now that race, it sure looked like the inside wasn't bad. I'll say that no. much. Um, no. made the run down there and then was able to re-rally down there. And those brothers in England are uh, raising pints right now because <laughs> yeah. they just they just cashed uh, if they kept the faith with uh, with Dak Daniels. I, uh, I, I, you know, I hope I never have to do one of these on a phone ever again. Um, <laughs> I, I, I hope I have a, a, a place where I'm not, you know, doing one of these and I hope nobody has motion sickness or anything. <laughs> I apologize. Oh, you did a great job, and, and thank you so much, Matt, for, for persevering. Great no, contributions course, as ever. Um, um, look, looking forward to the racing this weekend. Um, programming note for those who listen to the pod, there's no pod this coming week. I'm off this week. The following week, we'll pick it back up. So just this, this one-off. Um, totally fair. But, yeah, looking, looking forward to, to checking out what these three-year-olds can do and, um, you know, seeing if – boy, I, I would be terrified if Hot Rod Charlie built upon that Belmont because if he, if he does, I mean, he's – He's not only one of the best three-year-olds, he's one of the best horses, period, in the United States. So uh, I think this weekend will be fun. Looking forward to it and uh, looking forward to – I tell you what, the other thing that's kind of brutal for me out here, my favorite golf tournament in the world is happening this week. And typically it's my favorite for a number of reasons, but on the East Coast it's beautiful. You wake up in the morning, final round or whatever round you're watching is done by call 1 o'clock, somewhere thereabouts. Out here, I woke up this morning – there was only a handful of guys still out on the course. Everybody else was done. Boy, it's a, it's a giant time change. We're going to have to figure that out, but the open uh, going on. So there's a lot of good, a lot of good quality sporting events going on over the next uh, handful of days. I'll tell you one very quick thing and then I'll let you go. You do not have to stay till the, till the, the, the bitter end, if it's going to be any kind of delay here, but did you notice the baseball game last week at Petco park is supposed to be a pitcher's duel Darvish and Scherzer. And Darvish gets knocked out of the box, eight nothing, for the road team, and uh, and you know eight nothing the road team multi side young winner on the mound. Padres come all the way back. I'm sitting in the fifteenth row with Susan and Perrin. Imagine trying to tell an eight year old the <laughs> significance of what she just saw. It's like you you could live to be a hundred and not see a team come back from eight nothing, let alone against Scherzer. And and you got to see you know Tatis hit a home run and all this all and and the, the crazy home run from the the, For pitcher, the relief who, pitcher right yeah, I mean it's yeah. insane <laughs> it was one of the funnest baseball games I've ever been to anyway shout out to Petco Park uh, go Padres uh, but anyway you you can check out Matt I'll, I'll take it from here let you guys get back on the road but again thank you so much for your contributions always a pleasure my friend all right guys be well talk to you soon. All right, there we have it. The great Matt Bernier uh, going to enjoy a well-deserved vacation for, for a few days. No Matt Bernier show next week, but he will be back soon. Um, I don't know if he's on Horse Player Happy Hour next week. We'll figure that out. We haven't quite got there yet. Just waiting for producer Craig to tell me these scores are final. We'll read them through and we'll call it. But boy, that was a fun trip out to San Diego. Everybody thinks I'm nuts because I was out in San Diego right before Del Mar I didn't stick around for Del Mar, but there was no way, folks, that I was going to miss this. These are not final scores. This is halfway home, but we'll go ahead and read them. John Van Neal has taken over uh, sole possession of first place with 56-70. Then we have a slew of people at 51-80. David Browning, Julie Laboyko, Michael Domabil in that group. Gary Adley hanging tough in fifth place. Todd Van Dree and Roberto Fabricatore in uh, a tie for sixth. Two Bruce Meyer entries still there. Crescencio de... Kayanen in eighth place, tied with Steve McNatton. Pat Nufrio, who I met a few years ago at the NAC. Chad Shiana, Joseph McKay, who we hear from periodically. Our buddy John Gasper, been such a positive contributor in our comments. He's also in that uh, scrum with the 3680. I'll read a few more. Uh, we'll give a shout out to Howard Yankovic, William Beamer. Brendan Lindgren, Aaron Reed, Kevin McIntyre, we know him from Twitter, and Howard Johnson. Pretty sure neither the restaurant mogul nor the baseball player, but you never know, folks. You never know. Okay, good stuff. 
Uh, that's going to do it, folks. Uh, Matt Bernier, thank you again. Thank you, Producer Craig. Thank you, our friends at the Breeders' Cup, especially uh, Haley Amos over there. Maybe we should have asked her who she liked in some of these baby races today. Um, shout out, though, most of all, to all of you, the viewers and listeners. One more quick shout out to horseplayers.com, horsetourneys.com for, for hosting us. But it's really the viewers and listeners who we like the most around here. They make the shows fun to do. And in this case, they support them. They support our fantastic Thoroughbred Charities. I didn't talk enough about them this week. Thoroughbred Retirement Foundation, Thoroughbred Aftercare Alliance, doing amazing work for the horses that make this whole game go. Going to be hearing a lot more about them next week. I can promise you that this show has been a production of the Breeders' Cup and In the Money Media. Our business manager is Drew Cotney. Our chief creative officer is Jonathan Kinchin. I'm Peter Thomas Fornital. May you win all your photos. <laughs>